In 1881, the 29th and 36th Regiments were linked with the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the Worcestershire Regiment, with depot here at Norton Barracks, outside Worcester. At the same time, the 45th and 95th Regiments were linked with the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the Sherwood Foresters, with depot at Normanton Barracks in Derby. Between then and the end of the century, both regiments carried out colonial garrison duties with the Sherwood Foresters fighting in Imperial Campaign in Egypt and on the northwest frontier of India. Here, Lieutenant Henry Purnell won the Victoria Cross, attempting to rescue a wounded brother officer under heavy fire during the storming of the Dargai Heights. And at the turn of the century, both regiments sent battalions to fight the Boers in South Africa. This memorial outside Worcestershire Cathedral commemorates the men who fell there. In this war, Corporal Harry Beat and Private William Bees of the Sherwood Foresters both won the VC. But the First World War stands apart for all conflicts before or since. More men of the two regiments perished in battle during those four terrible years than in all the remainder of their 300 years' history put together. Between them, they raised 55 battalions and over 20,000 men were killed. The bravery, endurance and dogged perseverance of our forefathers from the sodden Flanders trenches to the flyburn hills above Gallipoli are in the true meaning of the word awe-inspiring. The Worcesters were the first into action, with two of their battalions giving the confidently advancing Germans a nasty shock with the musketry of the old contemptibles at Mons in 1914. The British Expeditionary Force then conducted a footsore, weary retreat until this man, General Sir Horace Smith Dorian of the Sherwood Foresters, decided to turn and give the pursuing Germans a bloody nose at Le Cateau. Smith Dorian, or Smith Doreen as he was known to the soldiers, had narrowly survived the massacre at Isel Dwana in the Zulu War as a young lieutenant and had commanded the 1st Battalion of the Sherwood Foresters in the Boer War. Le Cateau was his finest hour. After the Germans were stomped on the Marne, the race northwards to the sea begins. That race took the British Army to the shallow bowl of waterlogged land that became the Ypres salient. Here, on the 31st of October 1914, celebrated as the fourth and final regimental battle on a day, the 2nd Battalion of the Worcestershire Regiment, for the very last time, affected the outcome of the whole war in one single mad dash forward by less than 400 men. In a hurricane bombardment and determined attack by the Germans, the British line had been broken wide open. All that stood between them and the Channel ports was the last reserve, 370 men of the 2nd Worcester under Major Edward Hankey. Sent forward in a desperate attempt to stem the tide, the Worcesters advanced steadily, while all around them, wounded, stragglers and field artillery withdrew at their best speed. Having no real idea of what he faced, and a thousand yards of completely open shell-swept ridge to cross, Major Hankey gave the order to advance at the run. Over a hundred of the Worcesters fell, but the remainder caught four German battalions completely unawares in the grounds of Gallifel Chateau. Ejecting them unceremoniously with the bayonet, the Worcesters came unexpectedly on the remnants of the South Wales borderers. The pell-mell counter-attack had stunned the enemy and bought enough time for a new defensive line to be hastily formed to the rear of the Worcesters. The line had been stabilised and, as Lord Selborne said, the Worcesters had saved the Empire. The German general staff studied the Gallivelt counter-attack between the wars as an example of the triumph of speed and initiative. They themselves never failed to counter-attack speedily in the next war as a result of this. By the end of the year, the trench lines were fixed from the Channel to Switzerland. The Worcesters launched the first real trench raid of the war, on which this film is based. It took place at Christmas and was led by Lieutenant Frank Roberts. He was to win the VC four years later, while commanding his battalion at the age of 26, the regiment's youngest ever CO. The next year, the war spread to other theatres, and the two regiments followed it. Both sent battalions to fight in Italy and at Gallipoli, whilst the Worcesters also fought in Macedonia and Mesopotamia. At Neuve Chapelle in 1915, the first battalions of both regiments fought side by side in a desperate to and fro action, where Private Jacob Rivers of the Foresters won the VC, and the Worcesters defeated a German attack by the unusual tactic of getting out of their trenches and bayonet charging it. The attackers were the 21st Bavarians, who, in the words of an eyewitness, came in a great mass, their officers in front, waving their swords, and then a great rabble, followed by a fat old blighter on a horse. At 75 yards, the Worcesters mowed them down with the mad minute of rapid fire, and as they reeled under the impact, broke from their trenches and charged, back the rabble went, full tilt for their own trenches 400 yards away. In the aftermath, 
a composite company of Worcesters and Sherwood Foresters, was formed due to casualties and confusion. It was just the latest in a long line of incidents in which they'd fought side by side by Buenos Aires in 1807 to Tobruk in 1942. The next year came the terrible Somme offences, which have become a byword for slaughter and futility. The 4th Worcesters are coming out of the line of the Somme. Private Turrell of the 10th Worcesters was released from one of his frequent spells of detention to take part in the attack by his platoon commander, Lieutenant Jennings. Turrell repaid him by spending the day in a shell hole defending and tending the wounded Jennings, an action that won him the Victoria Cross. The Sherwood Foresters lost heavily on the Somme, the 1st and 2nd Battalion both going into action over 600 strong and losing 326 and 438 men respectively. The 1st Battalion losses included three out of four company commanders. Both regiments fought to Passchendaele in 1917 to resist the final German spring offensive. In the course of the war, the two regiments won nine VCs each. Captain John Crow of the Worcesters received his from George V. Crow is the only man known to have won the Victoria Cross whilst already holding the Long Service and Good Conduct Medal. When he won the VC for leading small groups of men in three desperate counterattacks, he was 42 years old, having served in the Worcesters for 20 years and been commissioned from Regimental Sergeant Major. He fought in the Boer War and twice been part of the winning regimental team at the annual Army Shooting Championships at Bisley. Perhaps the most famous VC won by a member of the regiment was that awarded to Captain Albert Ball. He was a Sherwood Forester and son of a future Lord Mayor of Nottingham who served for just 15 months over the Western Front in the Royal Flying Corps. During that time he became a national hero as the aeroplane, war in a new element, seized the popular imagination. He became one of the war's top scoring air aces, winning the Victoria Cross, four distinguished service orders and the military cross before being shot down and killed before his 21st birthday. On a visit to the Western Front today, very few of the hundred of cemeteries dotted around northern France and Belgium will be found without gravestones cut with our regimental badges. All the members of the regiments, whether regular, reservist, territorial, volunteer or conscript, fought in the highest regimental tradition. Between the wars, battalions of the regiment continued the ceaseless border warfare of the northwest frontier in Waziristan, kept order in Arab disturbances in Palestine, and kept Greeks and Turks apart around the Black Sea. New colours were being presented to the Sherwood Foresters by His Grace the Duke of Gloucester at Derby in 1935, 60 years ago this month. The crowd, 30,000 strong, dwarfs the numbers that could be expected to turn up for the same ceremony today. During the Second World War, the regiment suffered only a small proportion of losses of the first, less, in fact, than 10%. Both regiments were severely reduced in numbers during the retreat to Dunkirk, and the same year a territorial battalion of the Foresters was largely lost in an abortive operation in Norway. The Worcesters spearheaded the recapture of Ethiopia from the Italians, and then both regiments met in the Western Desert. Here the Worcesters are at Gazala, where they blunted Rommel's offensive before falling back onto Brook. Elements of both regiments went into the bag at Tobruk, while in the same year a Sherwood Forester battalion ceased to exist in the fall of Singapore. The next year, the Foresters were still in North Africa, fighting in the great turning point battle of El Alamein. The Foresters advanced through Tunisia in the campaign that finally threw the Germans and Italians out of North Africa. They advanced across the Neges Plain in a march that was to take them in over two years across North Africa and up the length of Italy. Three battalions of the Foresters fought their way up that long mountainous peninsula. With its many rivers and precipitous terrain, its baking summers and freezing mountain winters, Italy provided the Germans with line after line of natural defensive barriers. The Foresters ferried mortar ammunition across the Volturno River, returning with German prisoners on board. The same regiment took part in both the waterborne left hooks at Salerno and Anzio. The 2nd and 14th battalions saw particularly bitter fighting after the Anzio landing. The film of Forrester's support weapons going into action was staged for the cameras after Anzio. It was in Italy that the regiment's only Second World War Victoria Cross was won by Captain John Brunt of the Foresters, attached at the time to the Lincoln Regiment. This ex-physical training instructor was killed by a shell while having a cup of tea the day after winning his VC by covering his platoon withdrawal and then launching a single-handed counter-attack.
The 5th Foresters advanced with tank support towards the Gothic line in the area of Petriano. At the close of the Second World War, the Foresters saw active service in the increasingly bitter Jewish rebellion in Palestine. Meanwhile, the 1st Battalion of the Worcesters had landed in Normandy soon after D-Day in the Great Crusade to liberate Europe as part of the famous 43rd Wessex Division. The battalion fought at the village of Moor in their first action of the campaign. It was part of the attempt to break out of Normandy. The Worcesters advanced in open order, led by RSM Hurd, brandishing a shovel. Despite a complete lack of armoured support, success was gained because of surprise, lots of smoke and good battle drill. The divisional commander called it one of the slickest attacks of the war. The speed of the advance increased considerably until the River Seine was reached. The Worcesters were involved in bitter fighting. A German counter-attack was only broken up by calling friendly artillery fire down on A Company's own position, and the commanding officer issued a special order of the day down to section commander level. It read, The battalion will defend the left flank, and by defend I mean to the last man and to the last round. In this close country the enemy may infiltrate behind you, but remember, if you hold your fire, he can't locate you. And if he can't locate you, he'll walk straight into your trap. And if he walks into your trap, every bullet you fire will kill a German. There was more bitter fighting before the end of the war in Europe, with the Worcesters losing three out of four company commanders killed in the fight to relieve the British Airborne Division at Arnhem. That division had been commanded in Normandy by the regiment's most distinguished Second World War soldier, General Sir Richard Gale. Commissioned into the Worcesters in 1915, he eventually commanded the Rhine Army in the 50s before becoming Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. The only campaign of the war yet to recount is the one furthest from home. Two battalions of Worcesters played a large part in the defeat of the Japanese in Burma. They fought at Kohima, turned the enemy from the gates of India and pursued them south until they broke. This Burma teak plaque in Worcester Cathedral made by the regiment's pioneers commemorates those who did not return. After the war, both regiments served in Malaya. During the communist insurgency there in 1951, a native tracker, Awang Anak Rawang, won the George Cross for saving the life of a wounded Worcester during a jungle clash with the terrorists. Both regiments also served in Cyprus, attempting to keep the peace between the Greek and Turkish communities. It was during these troubles that the Blue Berry of the United Nations was worn for the first time. The Worcesters received new colours at Norton Barracks in 1960 from General Sir Richard Gale. Five years later, the Sherwood Foresters received new colours in Colchester from His Grace the Duke of Devonshire. These were to be the last colours presented to the individual regiments, as in 1970, the two were amalgamated to become the Worcestershire and Sherwood Foresters Regiment. It now served under its new name for 25 years, taking the best of the traditions and virtues of the two former regiments. Her Royal Highness, the Princess Anne, later to become the Princess Royal, consented to become Colonel-in-Chief and presented the first colours to the new regiment in 1971. The past quarter of a century has seen this regiment serving in Berlin as mechanised infantry in Hema in West Germany, in the jungles of Belize with the United Nations in Cyprus and twice as the Infantry Demonstration Battalion. In addition, the regiment has served six times in Northern Ireland. This painting depicts the West Belfast tour on which two of the five Worcestershire and Sherwood Foresters to die in action were killed. They are remembered in the regiment with the help of the various trophies and competitions that now bear their names. In 1994, Lance Corporal Clark of B Company was shot in the hand by an IRA sniper in Cross Glen. It is hoped that he will prove to be the last British Army casualty of the current troubles in Northern Ireland. Shades of Private Flynn at Sebastopol. The best shooting regiment in the British Army, we have a long tradition of success at Beasley and a large collection of silver shooting trophies. The Army now shoots a non-centralised competition every year in which 120 officers and men from each battalion compete. The 1st Battalion, the Worcestershire and Sherwood Foresters Regiment, have been placed first in this competition every year since 1986, ten years in all so far. In 1995, the battalion was the first in the UK to be equipped with Warrior, the new infantry combat vehicle. This fighting vehicle, equipped with a 30mm rod and cannon and an electric chain gun and carrying ten fully equipped infantrymen, give the infantry a massive increase in mobility, firepower and protection. 
1995 has been spent learning how to drive, fight and maintain the new warriors. They will take the regiment into battle at speed and will provide useful fire support. But when the time comes to close with the enemy, the infantry will do it just as they always have. On foot, with the bullet and the bayonet. Tidworth, on a Saturday morning in June. 300 years since a Coldstream Guards officer raised a regiment for King William III. The officer was Colonel Thomas Farrington, the regiment was the 29th. Thomas Allnut's regiment of foot was formed a few years later. They became the Vane Openers. The 45th Nottinghamshire Sherwood Foresters was formed in 1741, and the 95th Derbyshire a few years later. 25 years ago, those old regiments amalgamated to become what we see before us today, the Worcestershire and Sherwood Foresters Regiment. Twenty-five years ago, Her Royal Highness the Princess Anne presented the first colours to that new regiment as Colonel-in-Chief. And she arrives here today, now the Princess Royal, returning once more to present the new colours to the Worcestershire and Sherwood Foresters. A crowd of some four and a half thousand assembled to see this royal presentation of the colours as Her Royal Highness arrives in the cortege. The Princess Royal steps out of the car, escorted by the Colonel of the Regiment, Brigadier Ronnie Silk, CBE. And she's presented with a bouquet by six-year-old Amy Cotterell, the daughter of uh, Major John Cotterell, the project officer of the Colours presentation. Now Her Royal Highness takes the Royal Salute. Commanding officer of the regiment is Lieutenant Colonel Mark Jackson, OBE. Colonel Jackson is the only man on parade today who was at the previous colour ceremony as one of the ensigns 25 years ago. Colonel Jackson now marches to the dice and will halt and salute and reports the battalion awaiting inspection. Royal Highness now moves off the dais and will move to inspect the parade to the tune Galanthia.
Her Royal Highness now being introduced to the Director of Music, the Prince of Wales Division, and Lucknow, Captain John Huggins. And also to the drum major. Colonel Colour Sergeant Fuller. Sam Fuller, he is. Rather fortunate that the Prince of Wales Division Band is based at Lucknow and is therefore the resident band to the battalion. A very proud occasion this for many people, not only the serving soldiers, but ex-soldiers who've travelled from far and wide all over the United Kingdom, gathered here to celebrate the tercentenary of the regiment and also the 25 years presentation of the colours. Families, grandchildren, grandparents alike gathered to see the march past. Her Royal Highness always very keen indeed to uh, talk to the troops. And as Colonel-in-Chief takes a great deal of interest in the whereabouts of the regiment. And so to the regimental mascot. Her Royal Highness is now to be introduced to Private Derby the 26th, the regimental mascot. There's a continuous line of fighting rams going back to the one acquired by Private O'Sullivan at Kotar. This particular ram has been with the regiment for now some 18 months and it was presented by the Duke of Devonshire. It's a pedigree Swaledale ram from Chatsworth. Royal Highness inspecting the troops. Also static on display are eight warriors. Over the past four months they've been training the teams who will take these warriors into battle. The old colours stage centre. The new ones to be brought on a little later in the presentation. Her Royal Highness pausing every now and again to have a few words with some of the soldiers. A few words that they will probably never forget. Out of the watchful eye of their relatives.
Now that the troops having been inspected, the Royal Highness moves back down towards the dais. Past the crowd seated on the right of the great ground. Enjoying a few words there with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Jackson. And pausing to acknowledge the old colours. Colonel in Chief returns to her position on the dais in preparation for the trooping of the old colours. This will be the last time the old colours, which she presented 25 years ago to the regiment, will be seen on official occasions. But pausing a while to talk and pay acknowledgement to the debt we owe to the Chelsea Royal Hospital for old soldiers, the Chelsea pensioners. The regiment saw service in the 1st Battle of Ypres, or Wipers, in the First World War. The 2nd Battalion took part in the mad dash against the Germans in October 1914. They charged at the Germans to prevent them reaching the Channel ports, and in doing so, they cut short the enemy advance and saved the Empire. Their bravery gave rise to the 4th Regimental Battle Honour. At Passchendaele too, the Wussefs did their country proud. Colonel Jackson, who is the commanding officer, pausing a while ahead of the trooping ceremony. Escort now advances to the old colours. And the escort is found by D Fire Sport Company, which was selected to provide the escort to the colours because they won the best drill practice. Colours being trooped today for the last time, the old colours, were presented by Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal on the 1st of October 1971. The current colonel of the regiment was then the adjutant, and the Queen's colour, the Sherwood Foresters, was carried then by the current commanding officer.
So the escort, right dress. And turn towards the colour party. The old colours are being held by Lieutenant Robert Durant and Lieutenant Philip Kimba. Here comes the Regimental Sergeant Major, Phil Temink, who marches to the battalion colours. He salutes first the Queen's colour. RSM takes the Queen's colour and will turn and hand it to Robert Durant. Queen's colour having been handed over, the RSM turns for the regimental colour. Of note that this is the only time that the regimental sergeant major will draw and salute with his sword. Salutes the regimental colour. Now turns towards the junior ensign, who is Philip Kimber. The ensign's counter march, crossing the colours, and halt facing the escort. Escort to the colour, present arms. Ordered to slope arms. And the ensigns once again counter march across the colours and halt. And so, for the last time, the colours are brought to the escort to be trooped before the regiment for the very last time after 25 years' service. Trooping the colours by land and sea. Escort to the 
Escort to the colour. By the left. 